You're listening to the So What? Why It Matters podcast with Nancy Hicks. Each week we'll ask the question, so what? And dive into the answers of why it matters with Nancy and her guest. Are you ready for some honest conversation about the so what's in your life? Then let's get to it. Here's Nancy. Hi there, Nancy Hicks here. Welcome back to So What? Why It Matters. So right now, we are in our first series talking about why it's so important to hone our communication skills. To have this topic right out of the chute forced me to go back to first things. It's like God was saying to me, as you embark on this new means of communication, let's just review a couple of things. And the fantastic guests and my own time with God have really helped me crystallize that communication is ultimately about connection, about loving, about understanding and exchanging our stories and experiences. So this week, we're going to step back and just look at one of the biggest tools that we use to communicate with each other in this modern world, our devices. So these days, if you communicate with just a couple of things like text and email, you're kind of like a little bit in the dark in the dust. Because for many people today, it's not uncommon to be on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok, FaceTime, Zoom, and on it goes and everything in between to talk to and follow each other. Our phones are constantly pinging us, nagging us. Drop everything you're doing right now. Pay attention to me. Oh, and that reminds me. Okay, here's my public service announcement. When we're on social media, you know, you know that there are algorithms that show you only what they think you want to see. Pay attention to this and this. I know Nancy Hicks will want to hear about this. Say, for example, if anywhere on your social media you've communicated that you like baking bread, They're going to feed you what you want. They're going to feed you everything you need to know about the art of baking bread. They're making sure that your whole world can be about bread. So that means everything that you're thinking and what you are believing is getting fed right back to you, the very same messages. So you are literally staying in this echo chamber. We all think alike. We all see the world the same way way. Pay attention only to this. There are also dozens of filters that you can use to change the way you look. So you can make yourself look fabulous. Make yourself the way you think people want to see you. Next thing you know, without knowing it, right? We can be living in our own alternate realities. And it's weird our own little worlds with the same people who think and feel and look the way we look and think and feel as well, who care only about the things we care about and we parrot the same stuff. We were not made for all this. Technology's here to stay. We're not going to throw out our phones with the bathwater. In fact, I think if we view them just a little bit differently, maybe as tools, instead of extensions of our brains, then we might stand a chance to gaining a little more joy, a little more peace and connection from our interactions online and off. So to help guide us through all of this, I had the utter privilege of speaking with Andy Crouch. For years, he was an editor and producer at Christianity Today. And right now, he's a partner of theology and culture at Praxis. Very cool company. They call themselves a creative engine for redemptive entrepreneurship, where they support founders, funders, and innovators who are motivated by their faith to renew culture and love their neighbors. There's a new idea, right? Andy's written several books. And for our discussion today, there are two that you're going to want to check out. His 2017 book called The Tech Wise Family and his brand new book co-written with his college-age daughter, Amy, called My Tech Wise Life. So Andy spent a lot of time thinking through what it means to create the lives and the families that we want and how our use of technology contributes to that or not. 
and he offers a lot of wisdom for families and parents alike. And now with Amy, he's offering that advice to teens and young adults, showing them how to find meaning and wonder in the world. I know that you're going to enjoy our conversation, and I hope it helps you evaluate how to create stronger connections with your friends and loved ones, even for now through a screen. So here's my conversation with Andy Crouch. Oh, I'm so excited, Andy. I am so honored that you took the time, honestly, because I've heard your name around for years and years and years, sir. And I'm just so thrilled that you've taken the time to meet with me today. I am thrilled to be here. I'm so grateful for the invitation. Our producers tapped me and said, Nancy, Andy has written a book with his daughter, My TechWise Life. And I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> Get Andy Crouch for anything, A, but B, around this topic. It's just only ever so slightly relevant for us today. So I'm thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thrilled that we're talking about it. Can you tell me how it came with all your experience in writing Christianity Today, the books you've written, all your experience over all these years, how it came to be that you picked up the torch around this particular topic? Why, Andy? Talk to me about that. That's such an interesting question. This was not a topic that I was looking for, but my friends at Barna Group, which is a research group that studies kind of families and society and church, they came to me and said, we really feel like we need a book about technology and family life. And this was a few years ago. And I had been noticing something at the same time that they were kind of cooking up this idea. I spend quite a bit of my time, or at least I did before we all got locked down, speaking to different audiences and on lots of different topics, all kind of broadly around faith and culture and, and how we can kind of make the most of our lives in the world and live the life that really is life. And often, you know, in the midst of speaking, I would mention something about the way that our family had made choices about technology. So, for example, the fact that we didn't have a TV at all in our house. I hope this doesn't bother you. No, <laughs> uh, nothing bothers uh, me. <laughs> yeah, but until the kids were about 10, we just wanted to kind of use our time other ways. We have a really nice TV now and we enjoy watching it as a family, but in the single digit years, we didn't have a TV. This would just be like an illustration of something, some other point. But afterwards, there would be a line, often of young parents who wanted to ask more about that. They were like, tell us more about how you are managing technology, raising kids. And so I said to my friends at Barnard, I said, you know, I think actually <laughs> over time, not in a systematic way and often not knowing what we were doing, which is like what parenting feels like all the time. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we did arrive at some practices in our family that we feel like made a difference, not just for the kids, but for my wife, Catherine and me and for our experience as a family. And I said, I think I could write about that. So I wrote a book called The TechWise Family. It came out in 2017. And it was just 10 simple commitments you could try out as a family to help put technology in its proper place in your home. And then a few years later, we had this incredibly fun idea that maybe my daughter, who was raised this way and was now 19, she's 20 now, but when she wrote the book, she was 19 years old, that she could actually write from a kid's perspective what this is like and write for her fellow kids. So that's the most recent book, My TechWise Life, mostly by Amy with a little bit from me. I love it. And I lo obviously she's a sharp woman, Cornell. Is she still at Cornell she right now? Going back to her pandemic interrupted junior year at Cornell. Yeah. So let's just back it up a bit and just talk to me about some of what you are seeing. And maybe that's the thesis of the book, but some of what you're seeing in technology today. Yeah. I think the very deep story here is that we wanted superpowers. We have pursued superpowers. And, and when you talk to people in Silicon Valley, they'll often use literally this language. And it's almost become a, a bit of a cliche in Silicon Valley. But I heard it first from a, a tech founder who I was interviewing for a piece years ago for Christianity Day, himself a Christian, who said he was building these beautiful, amazing wearable watches, kind of fitness tracker type things. I'm in the world to give people superpowers. And he meant that as a good thing. And I think that we human beings have always wanted more <laughs> from our world. I think we're built to explore and extend our capacities in the world. 
But superpowers are about having incredible abilities that we never had before with very little effort. So I sometimes talk about technology as promising us easy everywhere. <laughs> that what we want is for our lives to be really powerful on the one hand, but really easy on the other hand. So if you think about like Superman, uh, I guess is the original superpower person, <laughs> he can fly through the air and it doesn't seem hard for him. Like he just decides to fly and he can fly. And that's really different from what human life was like until 100 years ago. Our great grandparents, if they wanted to get something done in the world, they had to work hard, whether with their bodies or with their minds, they had to exert effort. But the introduction of technology was the introduction of a way to get what you want in the world with very little effort. And that might sound really good, and I don't think it's all bad. But I think it has left us strangely alienated from even ourselves, from our own bodies. So we have this epidemic, the first non-infectious epidemic in human history is on playing in the Western world. It's called metabolic syndrome. A lot of us, I have some symptoms of this. A lot of people do. It's the combination of high blood pressure, pre-diabetes, and excess weight. And really, where does all that come from? It comes from easy everywhere. It comes from technology that doesn't really ask us to do much with our bodies anymore. So we're not moving. We're not moving around. And in the last few months, we've all been just locked in front of screens. And that's kind of a, a picture maybe of something that I think is happening, not just to our bodies, but to our relationships, to our communities. And it's all getting mediated. And in one way, it's very easy. It's easy to make a big storm on Twitter or on Facebook by posting something. It's super easy. And you can feel really powerful. Thousands of people, or if you're a certain kind of celebrity, millions of people will see what you do. But there's no forming happening of human beings. There's no shaping of us. There's no friction that would cause us to have to ask kind of hard questions about who we are and what we're doing and what we're learning. So I don't know if that gets to the heart of what we're experiencing right now, but I think it's, it's connected to a lot of the surprisingly bad things that are happening in a world where we have a lot of surprisingly good power. You would think like life would be getting better and better compared to our grandparents' era. But it doesn't feel that way. And I think it isn't because technology is not giving us what we wanted. And, and it's interesting, you know, Andy, this is really interesting to me because I am one of these people who, of course, we enjoy technology. I didn't want an email. I'm like, what do I need an email for? I remember when people are like, oh, everyone's got an email. What do you mean you don't have an email? I'm like, I don't need an email. Thank you. <laughs> Give me a ring, you know, if you must. But, you know, but I'm one of those, those people. I have two sons that are grown now. But I was like, Oh, give me the phone. Like you've got a real live person right in front of you. You are not texting. You are not talking. You are not doing something else on a device. When you get to spend time with your mom, you, get to think, <laughs> you lucky guy. <laughs> or, you know, like we'd be out, you know, seriously, like the idea of having phones on the table while we're eating a meal, like absolutely not. <laughs> In no way, shape, or form is that happening. So I'm with you at the same time, of course, here we are talking on Zoom. And at the same time, that perform, you know, in the same way, we've got all these incredible benefits. But the speed, the speed with which things are coming to us these days, one of the things that I, I'm just going to ask you to comment on this, one of the things that occurs to me these days is that we do, we're almost becoming like God, these superpowers, you know, like God, we are omnipresent Yes. We, we have all omniscient. the inf omniscient, yes. all information at our fingertips and omnipotent. We've got this whole what what once upon a time we only attributed to God. We now have at our fingertips. I'd love to hear your comments on that thought. The thing is, my own belief as, as a Christian is that, yes, I do believe the true God has those attributes, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent except that I don't think God, the true God as I understand God, actually uses his power in the way that we do when we get those same things. And this is kind of the tragic part of the human story is that we, I mean, Christians believe we human beings are made in the image of God. We actually are made to play God in the world in a way. That's what the image would do, the image bearer of the creator would do in the world. But we haven't actually played the true God, because when the true God became human, 
this is my own uh, speaking as a Christian, when I read of the true God becoming human, he, yes, he does have incredible power and, and incredible insight and knowledge of people and the world that he's in. Jesus of Nazareth had all of these things. And yet he appears as an ordinary person. He walks everywhere. He doesn't fly like Superman from place to place ever during his earthly life. He is willing to suffer. He's willing to touch people who are suffering. He's willing to listen to people who are suffering. There's this amazing moment when a synagogue leader named Jairus has a daughter who's dying and wants Jesus to kind of perform a superpower act, heal him. But there's this other outcast in the in the community, a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years. And it says Jesus heard her whole story. He stands there and just listens. Now, if you're omniscient, why would you need to listen, right? Oh, <laughs> and, yeah. And we who are omniscient with our technology, we often have forgotten how to listen. But Jesus, who Christians believe actually was God in some way, knew how to listen. And he knew how to be present, even though he could have been anywhere. And he knew how to hold back his power, even though he could have done anything. And that's what we lack, is the ability to kind of channel our abilities in a way that really leads to other people's flourishing and our own flourishing. In a way, we have too much of what we want because what we what we want and what we think God wants too, I think, is kind of control of our environment and the world. And you know, uh, you mentioned the device on the table and the temptation to be texting when your mom's right there. And we know, of course, it goes the other way too. I mean, parents, we as parents, struggle to be present to our kids. And Sherry Turkle is a psychologist. Uh, I was hoping you were going to bring her up because I've read <laughs> I've read her books. Absolutely, yeah, she's done quite amazing research MIT. on this yep. at MIT. She's a psychologist at MIT. Well, she's gone through a really interesting personal journey. She was a real enthusiast for the internet in its early days, but she's become much more skeptical. She's actually watched how people, especially young adults, emerging adults, use it. And one of her most interesting studies and, and insights is about why young people prefer to text rather than talk. Like why, if you could talk with someone on the phone or in person, why would you ever text them? And yet there's a lot of preference to keep the relationship in the little green or blue bubbles. Well, it turns out that when she both observes and then asks young adults, college students, why do you text? It's because when you text, you're in control of your communication. Because when I send you a text, I have time to look at it before I hit send, make sure I'm saying what I want to say. I'm not saying anything I don't want to say. And you don't get anything from me that I didn't decide to show you. Same thing when I post a picture on Instagram. I'm choosing the, the look. I'm filtering it before you ever see it. Whereas even now, you and I, are we're talking to one another. We have a, a video link, so we actually see one another as we're talking. But even if we were just doing this on audio, as our listeners are hearing it, there are things I'm communicating about myself, about the how I see the world, how I feel right now that I can't control in the tone of my voice, when I hesitate, when I make a mistake, I can't control any of that. And that's vulnerable, right? Oh, I love and it. add what it's like to be present in, in the flesh with another person and all the things they're picking up and noticing about you that you would rather they not notice and rather they not see. When you text, you can control it all. But this also means you're never really known. You're never really seen. And if you're never really known and seen, then you're never really sure that you're loved. And so we end up with incredible control, but at the same time, incredibly insecure, because we know in our heart of hearts that we've been controlling how other people see us, so they've never really seen us. And that means even if they say they love us, maybe they don't really know us. So it's this great like contradiction that we have all the control we could have dreamed of in a way, but it ends up making us more insecure, less connected, less sure of ourselves, more afraid to take risks. And I think this is happening above all for many young people because they're, they're kind of swimming in it, but it's happening really for all ages and all stages of life as easy everywhere kind of colonizes our homes and our lives. It's interesting, you know, I'd say to my sons, David and Aaron, now they're 28 and 26, but I used to say to them, I can't believe I get to be your mom. And I got that from a friend of mine. And I took that from her because I thought, what a precious thing to say to a child. I can't believe I get to be your mom, i.e., I can't believe I get you. Like, I feel that way right now. I can't believe I get to spend this time with you right now, Andy. I get a real live person with all kinds of history and stories and pain and thoughts and experiences. 
you know, we can get so yes. excited about a dog and then you look up the leash and you go, hi, and move <laughs> on. You know, there's a real life person, <laughs> Imago, a person there. Yeah, yeah. Imago Day, like right in front of our faces. <laughs> So we're going to get to those details around, you know, what do we actually do? I'm very passionate about this. Here's the thing I learned too, through Sherry Turkle, the data, you mentioned Barna and I'm on Barna. I'm looking all the time at what's going on in the church. And that's my, you know, my area of expertise. And I know that, and I, I, I 40%, we have dropped in empathy. Sherry Turkle was raising, you're raising the flags going, hollow, hollow. We have dropped 40% in empathy. And so to your point, we're not able to be known. We're not able to have, we can craft our, you know, those highlight reels on social media. I can put filters to make myself look better. What the heck am I going to spend time doing that for? Here's who I am right now take a look. But we can do that. And we do that. And people are spending time doing that. We've dropped 40% in empathy, meaning I am not picking up on the cues because I'm texting and doing a lot of things that are very much left brain require and, and accentuate the left brain, right? That analytical, very, whatever side intellectual, but my right brain, which is totally me, by the way, that right brain, the heart, the creative side, the empathetic side is being woefully ignored. I don't know. Do you have a thought about this? which of course goes to your point. <laughs> no, I, I think that's very right. And it's odd because we could have designed different kinds of technology, actually. At the dawn of technology, we could have said, you know, it's not good for people to be sedentary, to be sitting, right? We could have said, how do we make sure that these devices we're introducing really respond to emotion and help us perceive one another's emotion rather than just using that analytical side? I would say there's a lot of connections that have been lost. There's that right brain, left brain connection. They're meant to function together. There's also the body mind connection that I'm actually, I'm a person in the physical world. I need to move and engage in the physical world, even to think well, even to reason well. But we didn't have at the moment that, that some very fundamental, you know, we would say in the technology world, design decisions were being made. <laughs> in our family, we it, won't, it wouldn't work anymore, but it was practical at the time. And it worked for our kids. We told our kids when we got our first iPod, we told them, this is not called an iPod. It's actually called a WePod. This was back when the iPod was a music, you know, play your music collection. And we didn't want our kids or us with our little white headphones in having our own individual I, you know, little I musical experience. So we said, look, anytime we listen to music using this wonderful, amazing device, it's going to be together. It's going to be a wee pod. Now, why didn't Apple design something from the beginning that would be for to bring us together around music? Well, basically, because you can make a lot more money if you can sell or four people in our family, if everybody needs an iPod, that's four devices. <laughs> right, right. Not one shared. Exactly. So there were commercial imperatives. There were also just missing, misaligned pictures of what it was to be human that made us think we all wanted to be plugged in with our white headphones. And of course we did because it's safer. It doesn't have as much risk. Part of why we love that little doggy is frankly, the doggy is not, I mean, it might bite you, I guess, but dogs are not threatening in the way other people are risky for us in the way that cats and dogs are not. <laughs> and so to look up the leash and to have that same openness to that other human being that you might have to a little pet is a lot riskier. And so we all thought, I think I'll take my little white, white earbuds and plug in. And in my own little world, I'll feel safe. But then you're never known and you're never loved either. Friends, I'm so excited to share with you that registration is officially open for my new course, Awaken. Awaken is for women who are fed up with walking through their lives half asleep with little to no purpose or direction. It's for women who are ready to shrug off the toxic expectations and limitations they've taken on from the church, loved ones, and themselves, and instead step into full, godly 3D womanhood. It's for those who are thinking right now, yes, I'm so ready to take off my mask, get honest, and live fully alive. This work won't be easy. It's going to get gritty and messy. But I guarantee if you stick with it, you'll come out on the other end truly awake 
and unmasked with a vision in hand that brings you joy, purpose, and direction. Join me this February for Awaken. Learn more and register for Awaken by visiting nancyhickslive.com forward slash awaken or finding the link in our show notes. I want to ask you practically in your book, do you talk about for families, for people generally? Because I think sometimes I want to look at a mom and a dad or a single mom, whatever, and say, listen, you're forgetting you have authority. You have been given authority. You don't have to be authoritarian to have authority. And you are in charge. That little kid, that teenager, is not in charge. You are. Can you speak to the parent listening right now, Andy, please, and give us some tips? So I've got a couple of very practical tips, but let me preface it by saying two things. One is teenagers are always sending us mixed messages. That is, they're always saying almost sometimes in the same breath, come closer and stay away. (laughs) And the problem is a lot of parents only hear the stay away because we register the things that hurt us, frankly, more than we register positive emotion, negative emotion is more powerful for us. So we notice the stay away. And we've also got this kind of cultural script that says, oh, kids rebel against their parents and they don't want their parents' authority. The truth is for every time, I don't care who your teenager is, for every time they send you a message saying, stay back, keep out, they also send you a message saying, come closer, come in, I need help, I need you. And to back that up, when we did research for the original Tech Family Book, we asked kids, if you could change one thing in your relationship with your parents, what would it be? So this is teenagers. We asked them that question open-ended. The most single most common response was, I wish my parents would spend less time on their devices and more time talking to me. Stop, stop, repeat that. I beg of you, listener, listen to what Andy is saying. This is powerful. Would you say that again, please? The number one thing that a teenager wants, that, that they tell us they want when we ask for the relationship with their parents is that their parent would spend less time on their devices and more time talking with them. Now, those same kids, I guarantee their parents are like, oh no, they don't want me in their life. They just, (laughs) today we're like, get out of my room, dad. Shut up, yeah. (laughs) Teenage years are mixed messages the whole time. so hard. (laughs) You've got to believe that child, not just when they were an infant, but when they reached those awkward, complicated years, which we parented our own kids through, I can tell you, Back to your point, Nancy, they want you to exercise proper authority in their lives. And they know, and my daughter, Amy, did a lot more research for her book. And she talks about a lot more in her book. What Amy found is kids are very aware that this technology is not great. They sort of feel like they have to use it because they'll miss out if they don't, but they don't feel good about it. Just one other thing for parents to know that there's a guy who found the Center for Humane Technology, it's called. It's a Silicon Valley effort. And he speaks to a lot of different audiences. And he, when he speaks to high school students, At least I heard this from him a couple of years ago when Snapchat was kind of the hot thing in high school. I don't know if it still is. I think it's moved on. But there's this thing in Snapchat where you have to keep up this thing called streaks, where every day you have to check in with your friends or else you're not really friends. So he asks rooms full of high school students, how many of you keep up streaks with your friends? That is every day you send them some little snap, a little message. All the hands in the room go up. Then he says, okay, everyone close your eyes. And he says, how many of you wish you could stop? And all the hands go up. No, no kid is enjoying this. Everyone feels trapped by it. They all would love help from their parents and their community and their church and managing it. But we all are like, well, it's what kids want. Well, they want to be part of something. They want to be connected to their friends. But what they really want is some boundaries and some help. So number one thing you can do is have a rhythm of how we use these things. And I always say this is for the whole family. So this is not about parents setting rules for their kids. It's about the whole family embracing a different way, all of us, including the parents. And that makes it a lot easier because <laughs> if you try to set one set of rules for the kids and another for the parents, it's, uh, it's harder. So in our family, we had one hour a day, one day a week, and one week a year where we turned everything off that had an off switch. And that includes obviously all the phones and iPads and glowing rectangles, we call them in our house. So one hour a day for our family, that was dinner time. We had one hour where they're plugged in, they're turned off, they're recharging, they're having their little meal of electrons while we have our meal. 
And that was an hour, a precious hour. And by the way, we also turned off the, we actually turned off the electric lights. Like I really mean, we turned off anything that has switch, we turned it off and we lit candles as our kids were growing up. And so dinner time, most nights was not electric lit, it was candle lit. And I can just tell you, it changes everything and it's not that expensive. And it's like the most magical thing you can do. It changes your relationships and your conversations. One day a week for our family, that was Sunday, we turned off all the screens. And then one week a year, our family was able to go on vacation and we would turn everything off for a week. And I will tell you, your kids will resist at first and you will resist and everyone will feel this incredible itch toward that device. And then you get over it and past it and you start having conversations and playing games and doing other things. And you and often that hour comes and goes and you don't even go back or that day ends and you're like, oh, I wish I didn't have to go back to my screens. So this rhythm, which of course is rooted in this Jewish and Christian idea of the Sabbath, right? That, that we're not meant to be always on. Our devices wanna be always on, but human beings aren't meant to be always on. Is that it's the number one thing you can do. And then I think the other thing that we did in our home that made a huge difference is we actually kind of literally rearranged the furniture of our lives. We changed the space that we lived in so that the relationships that we wanted and the creativity that we wanted were at the center and technology and entertainment and kind of consuming instead of creating were at the edges of our house. So when we did get a TV, we put it way down in the basement. It's, it's a nice TV and it's a nice basement, but it's not like the center of our home. In the center of our home, we put a craft table with all kinds of art supplies when the kids were small. We have a piano that we taught them to play. We'd gather around and sing. Families used to do this all the time. Even if you didn't play piano too well, somebody knew how to play and people would sing. And we do that in our family. And then the other thing we, we did is no phones in bedrooms. And my daughter is the biggest advocate of this in our family now. I sometimes find myself kind of wandering up to my bedroom toward the end of the night with my phone in my pocket. And my daughter will call me out on it because we have a rule in the Crouch household, the, the phones stay in the kitchen overnight. They sleep somewhere else. And it makes such a difference for parents. I wish I'd known kids. that. I wished I'd known that. I would have taken that. I love that. It's that. so easy. You can do it. And you know what? And, and in the beginning, it won't be, right? No, in the won't. Beginning, it's not easy in the beginning. Right. You're right. You're going to have the tension, whatever. And then you're going to move through it and, and it'll be okay. And I want to ask you, could you please comment for people who self-identify as followers of Christ, for Christians, the church, I regard my social media platforms as the modern marketplace. I see it as a place that's sort of the wild, wild west. When I am conducting my social media life, I am wanting to make sure that I am thinking about it as that is the modern marketplace. It is not the church. It is the modern marketplace. It's not what you, and so the way that we engage with one another, the way the whole world is watching. I don't know, Andy, I'm sure you have much to say, but I would love to hear just a thought or two on that. Yeah, I think there's two directions in a way. One is inbound. That is, what are we letting into our lives? One of the things we know from studies of social media and the algorithms, that is the computer systems behind your newsfeed are trying to figure out what will keep you engaged. And what engages people is outrage, anger, conflict. This is what we linger on. It's why the news leads with the murder. I mean, lots of other things happen today, but if, if violence happened, they'll show that because that gets you watching. And I don't want anyone to hide from the reality of what's happening in the world or not be informed about the terrible things that happen in the world. But we get easily fixated on it and preoccupied by it. And so you really have to consider what are you consuming? And I curate my own consumption of media of all kinds, not to be uninformed. I'm well informed, I think, but to, to limit getting sort of swept along in the current of outrage and of violation and violence. And there's so much of that. And it's not just physical violence, it's words that degrade other people and that deny the dignity of other people. So that's the inbound that we need to pay attention to because really that's what's going to feed your heart. And then what comes out, I think I can't imagine a better kind of summary of what we ought to be putting out into the world than what Paul says in Galatians is the fruit of the spirit. It's love, joy, peace, faithfulness, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. And I need to be regularly 
auditing what I publish, make public in the world, like, because all of us are publishers now, making things public every day on social media. Is it marked by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control? And I need friends who will call me. I have friends. I've, I mess up from time to time. I have one friend who, when I put something on Twitter, I don't do this very often, but I remember one just super snarky thing I post on Twitter. And it wasn't untrue, by the way, but it wasn't marked by the fruit of the spirit. And within minutes, I had an email from my friend and he said, do you really want that going out with your name on it? And I was very defensive because what I said was not untrue and it wasn't even totally unfair. <laughs> it was just really snarky. And I was like, oh no, no, you're right. Thank you. And I deleted it and I apologized for it. So we really need to be examining are our lives showing the fruit of what we are told is the mark of someone who's been transformed by knowing Christ. I have to say, I've had the same experiences, Andy, when I've put things out and I do my very best to put the good things out there and a challenge. But, you know, I think that that's a really good grid to look at the fruit of the spirit. Okay. Is this true of me? And when someone is kind enough to say, Hey, Nancy, you're off that we would say, let me think about that. Mm, you're right. Shoot. I blew it. And let's pull back a little bit. I, I love your thought. Thank you so much for that. Now, listen, so what then? So what's it all boiled down to? So what, why does this matter so much? What can we tell our listener? There is a better life available to us with all the, I mean, our world is really messed up in ways we'll never fix. But what we found in our family was once we stopped chasing easy everywhere in our home and said, you know, what? we're going to do hard things first. We're going to have that awkward pause at dinner when no one knows what to say. We're going to push past that. We have lots of technology in our house, Nancy. I could take you on a tour of our house and you'd see, I mean, you'd see it all. I mean, because I'm a, I happen to be Me too. Group. I love this stuff, but it's in its proper place in our family's life. And it's at the edges, not at the center. And it's at certain times and not at the most important times. And we have ended up, I mean, this is utterly the grace of God, but we've ended up with kids who love one another, who love us, who create in the world rather than just consuming in the world, who know they're loved, who we know we're loved by. And all this, it's easy to describe it that way without, there's no time to describe all the hard things that go into that, but conflict, pain, tears, disappointment, forgiveness, all those things had to happen. And they wouldn't have happened if we'd all had our white earbuds in. <laughs> and so there's a better life, no matter how challenging and, and difficult your situation is, the more you set aside the devices as a family and in your home, and the more you work hard with each other and play hard with each other, the more you'll discover really a better life. Like right now, it's available. So that's so what for me, and it's why we've written these two books, TechWise Family and My TechWise Life, to show like it can be better. Even while things are really tough in the world, it can be better. So any other products coming up? Any other things coming down the, down the pike for Andy Crouch? Yeah, there's lots more resources at, if you Google My TechWise Life, which is Amy's book, uh, there's a whole page with resources. We're actually going to do a TechWise Lent this year and in 2021 help families just take some additional steps in this season when we often try to reset in different ways. And a year from now, I'll have one more book on this subject, kind of a bigger book about technology and loneliness, but that's not quite ready yet. Wow. This is a real focus for you. I'm thrilled to have you on to speak into this. Andy, I am so grateful for you coming on. So what? Why it matters with me today. I'm so thrilled. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. I love Andy Crouch. What a fantastic look at technology and how we can actually use it to connect with people. I love how proactive he's been with his family, even before technology kind of came at us with such such fervor and speed. But just, just especially now, putting up boundaries, renaming things like the iPod, calling it the WePod. I thought that was really profound and just really takes it away from the individual to the collective. That's all about connection, right? I love the way he also talked about sort of these rhythms of technology, rhythms of use, Sabbathing from them. These are proactive tips that you can just take away and put to use right away. So here's the so what moment I found when I was talking with Andy. 
right out of the gate, he talked about sort of these superpowers and giving people what they want, giving us what we want in terms of speed and power. We're omniscient, we're omnipresent, we're omnipotent, kind of godlike, but we do not have what it takes to be God. And we are not developing our children, our teens, ourselves. We are not developing the muscles that we desperately need to move through friction, to move through facial expressions that, that, that show us, ooh, I'm not hitting the mark here. Ooh, I'm offending. We're not developing that muscle to work through the conflicts and the discussions and the mess we want it all so easily, and it's not helping us any. So I love the fact that he talked about that, that he addressed that, and that is definitely a so what takeaway from me today, Nancy. Continue to work at, don't expect things to come easily, continue to work at the things that really and truly will move us through the mess and the hard stuff to connection again. So I want to say a big thanks to my podcast team at Four Eyes Media. That's Amy Kerr, my producer, Caitlin Hine, who books our fabulous guests like Andy Crouch, and our executive producer, Laura Knightsling. Thank you as well for hanging out with us today. I'm so grateful. And as you take out your headphones and get on with your life, remember, remember, remember what we talked about here today and always live for what matters. See you next time. Thanks for joining Nancy for another episode of So What? Why It Matters. Come back next week for more lively conversation and answers to those So What? moments in your life. And be sure to subscribe to the So What? podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like the show, please give us a review and tell us why. And if you don't, as Nancy would say, so what? Just kidding, all your reviews matter. So until next time, live for what matters.